Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Well series. I'm Tara Parker Pope, founding editor of Well, the Times Consumer Health section. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by our personal health columnist, Jane Brody. Jane, welcome. Thank you very much, Tara. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Well, I always love talking to you and I always learn something. So I'm very excited about today. Um, we are going to talk today about healthy living at home, making healthy choices during the pandemic. Um, but we also want to hear from you. Um, we will be taking questions live from our listeners. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you're dialed in on your phone, press star nine to raise your hand. If you're chosen to ask a question, you'll hear from our producers in the chat when you are on deck. Once you're on the air, please give us your name and where you're calling from. We will try to get to as many people as possible. Um, we know you all love Jane and you wanna to talk to her. Um, please note this is, event is being recorded. So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna chat with Jane and I want all of you to start uh, joining in and asking your questions. We're really happy you're here. So Jane, tell me, how long have you been writing the personal health column for the Times? I started writing the column in November 1976, before probably most of our readers were even born. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And you have literally written a column every week since then. I know there was one column that was held. We don't have to get into that story. But except for one day, <laughs> you've, ri you've written every day for a week, right? Every week. I, every week. I write every week. Ex with the only exceptions were when the Times science section had a special section that they didn't want any columns in. So right. there were a few that I, that were missed, but not many. It's yeah. not even worth mentioning, actually. I don't know how you've done it. So you had a column today that I really loved. It was all about your daily life during the pandemic. And you started it with this reminder that even though you're Jane Brody and you always seem to have all the answers, that this has been challenging for you too. Absolutely. I don't know anyone who has escaped uh, from the... the stress, the anxiety, the concerns surrounding this virus and what it has done to, the, to our lives, to our economy, to our future, to our children, to our grandchildren, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And just today, uh, there's a story in the Times from the uh, therapists, psychotherapists, who themselves admitted that they were being stressed out, even as they are talking to all of these people and trying to help people who are trying to get through this. So we're all in the same boat, so to, so to speak, and with different degrees of stress, to be sure, depending upon your financial and social situation. But I live alone. My basic co companion is my little dog. And thank goodness I have this little dog because he does get to get walked three times a day. And I take him out on the street and we meet people on the street with our masks on and staying six feet apart at least and have some conversations. So I don't feel totally socially isolated. Yeah, you had a comment in your column today that even though your life has changed by quite a lot, that your dog's life hasn't changed at all, right? <laughs> the dog doesn't have to social distance. And so they go right up to each other um, and sniff and say hello and run around in the park. Uh, they have a good time. And it's it's still fun for me to watch them having a good time. Yeah, the dogs are providing a lot of entertainment. You know, we've already got some questions. Would you like to take our first question? Sure. Um, so Sue is on the line. I don't hear Sue. I think Hi, she... Jane. Can yes. you hear me? Now I can. Great. Uh, Jane, like Tara, I enjoyed reading your column this morning. And I was so curious about the 40 minute back exercise program that you do in the morning. Could you tell me a little about that? Well, I have two back issues. One is scoliosis and the other is a chronic kind of sciatica problem um, from arthritis. I mean, my, I'm, I'm gonna be 79 years old in a few weeks and it has taken its toll on my body those years. Uh, so I do exercises on the floor that have been prescribed for me by a scoliosis expert and by a, a physical therapist for both of those problems. So tell us about, just give us a couple of the exercises you do, just so people can maybe, if they want to try some of them at home. Well, one of them 
one of them is a, um, a side slant. I can't think of what they call it in, in Pilates or yoga. Um, you are on one arm and, I'm, and the other arm is up in the air, and you're on one side and you're, you're off the ground. It's, it's very hard to describe this verbally. You really almost have to see it. But the other one, which I do also for 60 seconds each, is a kind of a push-up without pushing up, just staying up, but on my forearms, resting on my forearms, not, not on my hands. It's actually more difficult to do a push-up without having using your hands. So you're doing so, a forearm plank, it sounds like. A plank, that's the word. Yep. The plank. A, yes, a full arm plank. And, and I do a side plank for my scoliosis. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because right before this started, um, Dr. Jordan Metzl, who knows both of us, and he's an exercise doctor, um, he posted on my Facebook page to never challenge Jane Brody to a plank because... Uh, <laughs> I would lose. So let's take our next question from Susan. Where's Susan? I am. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm calling from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Right. Okay. Um, I am over 70 and very healthy, thank goodness. But my children are extremely upset that I go into stores very quickly in and out but I wear a mask and gloves every time I go in and out and I feel safe that way do you do you think I'm taking my life um, at risk by going into a store wearing a mask Susan, and gloves? Susan I'd be the last person to tell you that because I do the same thing and I am almost 79 the my kids have had the same prescription they do not want me to go shopping, but they're working 16 hours a day. Am I going to ask them to go shopping for me? No. I am not good at doing orders online and having people come and deliver them. Um, I don't even want somebody delivering anything to me, to be honest with you. But in any case, I go into stores the same way you do. I have a, a short list. I go in during the senior hour. I use gloves and masks. In fact, I use a double mask to go in the store just in case somebody comes too close to me. And I go to stores that have a good setup. They have a senior hour. They monitor how many people go in at any one time. They do not let a crowd in at all ever. And there's no lineup for the checkout. So I just really uh, am very careful. And that's the best you can do. And when I get home, I wash down the, the groceries, I wipe down whatever I can't wash, and I make sure that my hands and my face get washed at the, at the same time. Yeah, and Susan, you know, we've written stories in the Times about uh, parents and, uh, you know, adult children and parents in conflict over this very issue. And I think we all just have to find a balance for living our lives and keeping our parents safe and staying safe. And I think Jane's advice is good. I think you should minimize your trips to the grocery store. You should try not to go very often. I think you should take advantage of senior hours because the other people in the store are also, you know, at senior hours, you know those people are being careful also. And Jane mentioned to me that, you know, she likes stores that provide wipes. Uh, that wipe down the self-checkout, right, Jane? You use the mm -hmm. self-checkout. Exactly, um. exactly. There's, there are wipes when you come in and there are wipes when you go out. And they wipe down, I, I go to self, stores that have self-checkout so that they wipe down the, the checkout council, that, that, that cab, the thing that you check out at every t after every user. And that's a really important thing, I think, because you're pressing buttons with your fingers, even if you're wearing gloves. Your gloves touched stuff, and so who knows what was on the stuff that you touched. Um, it's, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to be super cautious, and, but you don't have to be a fanatic. I mean, I have friends who, ha who do not leave the house. They have not left the house for over two months. I mean, this would make me insane. I would be, a, you would be I would be certifiable if, that was, if, if I had listened to those kinds of proscriptions. And of course, with the dog, I have an excuse to go out anyway. 
happening. But okay, next question. So Susan, just I would say just try to reassure your adult children that you're taking all these precautions, maybe double mask, maybe promise them you're going during senior hours and maybe try to just, uh, you know, help them see that you're being super careful. I think we all have to be careful uh, any, at any age. Um, I would love to hear from Naomi now. Hi, I'm calling from the Bronx. And um, my question is, I have been um, staying at home. I, my job has allowed me to, but in the coming weeks, they're planning on reopening. It happens to be a childcare center um, with children of first responders. So the children, you know, are at home with people who um, may be carrying and bringing it in. And so I'm having to kind of negotiate moving from like safety and I guess luxury and the privilege of that into the world where essential workers are doing it every day. And it's a really, it makes me very stressed out. It's a really kind of hard leap to make. Um, it's a good story because nobody's really writing about childcare workers right. and when you can't socially distance. So if you have any thoughts on that, I'm all ears. I have some thoughts, Naomi. How old are you real quick? What's your age? You might've been muted. Um, I'm 63. Okay, Jane, do you wanna jump in on this or do you want me to take it? What do you think? I want you to take it because honestly, I think that is a dilemma that's chronic and it's certainly true for the families of, social, of, of everyone who's an essential worker, anyone who's delivering food, anyone who's working in a, in a medical center, anyone who's a, a safety officer, uh, on the subways, uh, the police, the firemen, they're all potentially exposed and they all go home to families and they all face the same kind of issue that Naomi is talking about. It, it's true. And I, I really don't know if I'm going to have good advice for you. I think you have to just make a decision. I mean, this is, you know, you've become an essential worker, especially if you're taking care of children of essential workers. I think you should think about your mask um, and being masked at all times. I'm hoping the daycare center allows the, I, I'm certain that they're going to allow you, you to wear a mask. I personally, I mean, I know that they're trying to save N95 masks for healthcare workers. Um, I think that if you had access to that kind of mask or maybe double mask like Jane was talking about, I think washing your hands a lot. Um, I think we're all gonna have to go forward with our lives at some point and there's gonna be some level of fear. Um, I just know that if you can uh, protect yourself as much as you can and, you know, I think the hand washing, especially by the kids and by you, you know, you're up at a higher level. I mean, I think when we hug children, we have to think about teaching them to, you know, hug our waist and our knees. You know, we tend to hug with our faces. I think that sort of thing is going to have to change. I think children are excellent, though. They can learn. Um, they can learn things like high fives or, or, or not even high fives, elbow bumps or foot bumps and things like that for greetings. And I think there's steps you can take. So I think you just really need to talk to your um, the center where you're working about what precautions are they taking? Are they providing uh, personal protective equipment for the caregivers? I also think that I would probably, if I were in a situation like that, even though I would tell most people that you don't need to change your clothes, um, when you go shopping, when we go out into the world, I think there's very, very little risk that our clothing gets contaminated. But I think if I were full time, in an environment with a lot of children and the children of first responders, I might make the choice when I came home to go ahead and just change clothes and take a shower and, you know, put my clothes in a bag, you know, just take kind of the precautions that a healthcare worker would take. I think that might yes. be what you need to do. And the, the center should certainly have available within the classroom or whatever rooms that you're in, uh, sanitary wipes and perhaps running water, if it's at all possible, where the kids, have to deal with this also. The kids have to wash their hands all the time. They're going to be around other children who could have be carrying the virus. Any one of us could be carrying the virus. Right. So we have to just make that assumption that everyone is potentially a risk factor. All right. I'd love to hear from Laura. Laura's on the line. Laura? Sorry, that was my phone. Is Laura here? If not, we can move on. A couple more seconds for Laura. 
while we're waiting for Laura or getting waiting for instruction, um, Jane, what do you do when you are out on the street and you see somebody who's not wearing a mask or not taking precautions? This is a real problem. I am trying to calm down a little bit because it has really made me insane uh, when I see people who, who re- sometimes there are two people walking together who obviously are a couple of some sort, and one of them's wearing a mask, the other one isn't, and they come within two feet of me. Um, I don't feel comfortable with that. And so I have asked, I have either pointed to my own mask on my face as I pass them, or I say, would you please cover your face when you're out? Now, most people totally ignore me, I admit, but I keep thinking that if I say it often enough, if I'm polite about it, I don't scream at them, although I've been tempted to at times, uh, I really hope that they will reconsider the next time they go out to cover their faces. This is not too complicated. You don't have to wear the mask 24-7. You just, even if you just use a bandana, and I've seen a lot of people in the streets of New York doing this. It's a very simple solution. You have the bandana. It's probably uh, tied behind your neck um, that you can pull up as soon as you come near a person. You don't have to have it on if there's no one else on the street. But when yeah, I would, comes I, along. I would jump in and say that it's better to mm. not fuss with your mask outside. You should probably just leave it up. And, you know, you don't need your hands near your face. Just wear the mask because it's the right thing to do um, when you're outside and you're in public. Ellen is on the line. We have actually a lot of callers. So we are getting to all of you. So um, if you're holding, don't hang up. Don't give up on us. We'll get to you. We'll, we'll try to move a little faster. Um, so we'd love to hear from Ellen. Ellen, what's your question? Hi there. Um, I have the, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great, great. I have a, a, a question that is probably less dire, but equally important, I think, especially I know that, that Jane is, is very big on exercising. I live in Berkeley, California. I normally swim outdoors all year round in the heated pools at UC Berkeley, which are closed. I have been substituting my daily swimming exercises with massive walks, socially distant walks in the hills. And I am, it, it's not doing it for me psychologically, and it's not doing it for me for my upper body. And this seems like maybe a frivolous question, but, but it's, it doesn't feel frivolous on a daily basis. Ellen, it is not frivolous. It is definitely not frivolous. I have the same problem. I am a daily swimmer, and I have not been able to swim since mid-early March. And this is very, very frustrating. And I have the same upper body issues. I have been trying to do some weights. I have some small weights in the house and I've been doing some weights to just feel like I can maintain my upper body strength. I do bike and I do walk, but the, the upper body exercises are much more challenging if you're not a swimmer, if you can't swim. So I do understand that. And I also understand the psychological issues of not being able to get that wonderful soothing effect of the water. But start thinking about as you're walking outside, take a look at, around you. I, I really think it helps enormously to start noticing the wonderful things in the world that are not stressful. The, the blooms, the grasses, the this, the little kid that you might see on the street, you know, one of, my, one of the sadnesses about wearing a mask is that I can't smile at all these kids. But I'm assuming that they'll know that I, when I say something sweet to them that I'm really smiling. And that really helps a lot. All right. Great answer. Paulina, we'd love to hear your question, your brief question. Can you get on the line? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, Paulina, welcome. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on like the emotional eating aspect and being, I, I'm actually calling from London. And so, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people can relate in some areas of, of the U S um, just smaller spaces. So you're, you're naturally near the kitchen and like mindlessly snacking. And, and for me, it's like the anxiety kind of turns into just comfort eating. And so any tips on that? Jane? Well, yeah, I, I made a rule. I just simply made a rule that I can't do this. I just had to say that right at the beginning because otherwise I would be there 24-7 eating something. And 
I, I try to work in a different spot from where my food is so that I don't carry food into the, into the work area. Um, but snacking, I mean, if you're going to have snacks, make sure that they're snacks that are good for you uh, and not have cookies and candy and, and chips and, and that sort of thing lying around to tempt you at every turn. Um, and maybe look for some other sources of comfort than food. I know this is a very common problem, and, it, and comfort food, which is usually high in carbohydrates, usually simple carbohydrates, which are very unhealthy, and I have to add to that the fact that these unhealthy carbohydrates put you at greater risk of getting this virus. So I would ask, uh, jump in for Paulina also, because I, I deal with this. I don't have Jane's amazing self-discipline. Um, so I have really had to focus on if I, if I do just want a snack, I want to munch. I have been really trying to keep the foods out of my house that would create a problem. So I try to, you know, apples, I have fruit. I have found that like blueberries with um, some plain yogurt is surprisingly satisfying. Um, I'll make a homemade smoothie. Um, it's not the perfect choice, but a homemade smoothie with yogurt and berries and no added sugar really can hit the spot. So I've just been looking for, you know, even before the pandemic, we've talked to people about, you know, finding your go-to snack, finding that thing that you can eat that will give you some sense of satisfaction. We know that maybe spicy nuts, um, spicy foods can stop cravings. Um, nuts are great. Yogurt's great. Um, Microwave popcorn in a pinch, you know, a little bit of that's not too terrible if you've got the right kind. I, I think you've just got to plan for uh, the cravings, try to sate them with something healthy. And like Jane said, find other sources of comfort. Weirdly, I find that if I watch like a cupcake cooking show or, a, you know, one of these sort of baking shows, it's, it's weird. It actually does not make me crave the food because they're so beautiful. I just enjoy it. And I get a lot of, uh, that may not work for you, but weirdly it works for me. So um, I hope this is helpful, Paulina. Um, Duncan, we would love to hear your question. Duncan? Hi. Yes. Hi. I live in a place where probably only in about half of the people are wearing masks. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder whether it's safe if I'm walking on the sidewalk to walk past them within six feet or to, is it better to walk behind them and how far behind? Because you know this uh, in the air, does it, uh, um, does it linger in the air? We until lost him. No, 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 I've got Duncan. I can still hear him. Are you there, Jane? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Hi, Duncan. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm speaking too softly. I'll try to speak louder. No, 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 no. It just ended. It, the, you stopped speaking. But anyway, uh, I will tell you, what, it, what I've seen in New York is a lot of people actually walk into the street to avoid going too close to somebody walking on the sidewalk. That's a very nice thing. One of the things that I do is I step to one side and wait till they pass by not too close. And you know what? The nicest thing is that so many people say thank you. And yeah, if I've, somebody does that for me, I say thank you. I've noticed that too when I'm walking my dog and if I keep going and the sidewalk's gonna get too close, we just sort of stop and wait. Um, I do think this virus is teaching us all a lot of patience. Um, Duncan, I would tell you also that uh, from the, the aerosol scientists that I've spoken with, I think the risk outside is very, very low. Um, between the breeze and the sunlight and just aerodynamics and just the way particles work, um, I think your risk is very low. Uh, I talked to a particle scientist who told me that what she does is before all this, and maybe somebody was smoking on the street, she would, she would sort of give them a wide berth uh, because she didn't want to breathe in their cigarette smoke. And she now treats everybody like they're a smoker. And she thinks about how, you know, what kind of path do I need to take to avoid what could be cigarette smoke. So I don't think it's a high risk situation. I don't think we should panic if somebody gets close to us. You know, the World Health Organization, their number is three feet. In the US, it's six feet. I much prefer six feet. I don't think getting necessarily behind somebody is the right answer because of the way, you know, slipstreams work. And I think just pass them, don't panic. You're wearing your mask. I think you're safe outside. Um, all right, we'd love to hear from Jody. Jody, what's your question? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, Jane, thank you. I've been with you since day one 
and Tara, so much fun with wellness. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm in the wellness business 22 years. And one thing that people are not talking about, and I'm dealing with it with my clients, is people that have had the COVID and are not recovering well. They're anxious, they're not breathing, they're, they're, it's not like you get a flu and you're back up and running. And, and I would love if, if you two could you know, give some ideas. I mean, I have my own for the world of how to recover, you know, tips of certain teas, um, you know, lung breathing, um, movements, just to get these people back on and not walking around. You know, you know the stress is not getting them better. So I don't know if you have any tips now for the recovery end of people that are still suffering, even though they don't have, you know, they're, they're three weeks past, but they're not back to a normal life. Right, right. Yeah, um, Jean. Well, I, I have a friend who's been exactly in that situation. And what she's been doing is she has some sort of an exercise program, but she just started with like doing basically one block and then two blocks and then the next day, try to get three blocks, uh, just gradually, gradually re-entering society in, in, in whatever way that's possible so that they build up some stamina because you're really exhausted after this virus. Even if you're not so sick that you had to be hospitalized, you're just so sick that you had to be in bed or you had to be home. And it, it takes its toll it lasts much longer and if you ever had the flu you'll know that the same thing happens with the flu but people don't take it as seriously as this and with the flu you can feel exhausted for six weeks after you've recovered and you just have to take that into account this will go away but i have to slowly slowly increase my stamina and and always always concentrate on how the quality of the food you're eating. It is really important to get in those fruits and vegetables. The protein is important too, because if you've been lying around, you've lost muscle mass. So protein is an important source of, of restoring that muscle, but you absolutely have to focus on healthy eating, whatever you can tolerate and slowly increase the exercise. All right. And Jody, just, um, it is a topic that we're looking at and I think we're still learning a lot. And I think in the coming weeks, you'll see more stories about helping people recover and, you know, just sort of things and advice for people in terms of exercise, diet, and just, you know, stress management and all the things. So I think you're right. I think you're onto something and I think we're going to work on those stories. So I would love to hear from Mimi now. Um, would you like to, we have a lot of questions in the queue and I want to get to as many as we possibly can. So let's try to try to move through this. So Mimi, what is your question? Yeah, hi. Um, I live in Bergen County, New Jersey, and um, so that might explain a little bit about my next question. I am a very healthy 71-year-old grandmother. Um, I live alone, and I just, I have been very, very, very careful. Um, I've been quarantine, self-quarantining. I work from home anyway. Um, I've been here for a couple of months. Um, I really, I can't live with the idea of not seeing my daughter and grandchildren again. And they live about 45 minutes away, also in Northern New Jersey. Um, and they've been extremely careful also. Now, what is this I'm starting to hear about what you might call a social bubble? Could I yeah. visit my daughter and my grandchildren? Um, even if we stay outside, I just can't live with the idea that I will never see them again. Well, I Mimi, think, yeah. Mimi, listen, I have, I have two grand, I have family here too. And they, they live eight blocks away, not 45 minutes. And once a week we have a stoop visit. We go, I go over to their house. They come out. I tell them I'm coming. They come out and they sit on the top of the stoop and I'm down at the bottom. And we have a 45 or a half hour uh, visit, talk to each other. And we cannot hug we cannot kiss. We cannot exchange goodies. We just have at least a personal experience. And that is a, it's a very tough thing. And I have a friend in Dallas who has five little grandchildren, little ones, and she is immunocompromised. So she has to be extremely conscientious. And so she has not had any face-to-face -face contact with her, her grandchildren, all of whom live nearby. 
but they come over. She leaves goodies for them on the on the porch. They come over and they see each other through the screen, through the window, and wave and they have a little bit of a conversation. At least they see each other. So it's, it's yeah. got to be a, a limited exposure. And Mimi, I do think that you are right that people are going to be creating these social bubbles where where you know, your home, your car to your family's home, that might be your bubble. If everybody is agreeing to certain ground rules, I would still be careful. I would still uh, keep it outside, keep it outdoors. I would still, you know, keep my space and not share food. And, you know, if grandchildren want to hug, they can hug your knees. Um, so I would just continue to be very careful. But I think that uh, people are realizing that, you know, mental health also matters and you can minimize risk. And, um, you know, talk to, you know, the family about what they're doing and try to find a way to stay connected um, in a safe way. But I don't think anybody wants you to not see your family um, for months and months because that would be terrible. Joan, I would love to hear your question. Joan, are you on the line? Hello, Joan. I'm sorry we're taking so long to get to callers. So many interesting questions. Hi, Jane. Uh, yes, Joan. I'm calling from Southern California. I was in your class at Madison High School. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I have followed your column for many years. I, I, I appreciate it. I'll tell you what my problem is. I get up at three o'clock in the morning and I can't go back to sleep. I'm worrying Join about- the crowd, girl. Join the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips? <laughs> so Jane, what are well, your tips for waking up what, at 3 a.m.? What are my tips? Well. One of the things I've, I've tried a number of different things. One, my friend suggested eating a banana. Okay, that does help some people. Um, I like to drink warm milk. I actually go down and put a glass of milk in the microwave and warm it up and drink it. And it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. And the bottom line is that when all else fails, if reading doesn't do it, if milk and bananas don't do it, if eliminating caffeine after the morning doesn't do it, then the next best thing is to simply forget about the worrying about not being able to sleep. Try to take a little cat nap in the middle of the day if you can. And if you can't, because I'm not a napper, I, I'm not good at this, just get to bed a little earlier the next night. But don't sweat it because worrying about how little you slept is worse than not sleeping. It's it's not going to kill you to to miss um, half a night's sleep every so often. But if you lie there fretting about it, it's going to you won't fall asleep again. That's for sure. And secondly, it will not. It it really isn't going to help. I would also recommend the Headspace app. They have a sleep. Uh, something for insomnia on there that I use and I, it, it works like a charm. It really does help me um, calm my mind and drift off because it, it, this has happened to me some too. And that's when I, when all else fails, I go and I listen to that and it usually knocks me out. Um, we've got a few more questions and, and about 15 minutes. So let's try to um, get as many people as we can. Sylvia, I would love to hear from you. What's your question? Hi. Yes. For, I have a comment and a question. Okay. Try to be fast because we're trying to get as many people as possible. I will. Yes, first, I thank you, Jane, for, for uh, mentioning your bicycle this morning. I just, I'm about to order a, a tricycle for myself. And mm. um, my question is when I'm, I've been meeting someone to sit um, six, six or eight feet apart. We're outside. It's usually a little bit windy there. Um, I've been taking off my face mask to talk to this person. Is that okay or not okay? Well, you know, taking off your face mask to talk, I don't think is necessary. I mean, I leave my face mask on and I have conversations as well with people who are six feet away. So I think it's possible to do if the person really can't hear you and you're outside, it's probably going to be okay. What do you think, Tara? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's better to leave your face mask on. It's better not to mess with it. We do know that you need some air. You want to air out your mask a little bit. 
Um, it's just, it's really not necessary. I would try, but again, I think if you need to take it off and you just need a break and you're six feet from someone and you're being careful and there's not crowds, you know, make sure you handle it from the loop on your ear. Don't touch the, the face part of it. You know, just mm -hmm. be very mindful of what you're doing. I would say do your best to keep it on, but you know, even doctors sometimes pull it off just to get a little air when they're in a safe space. And I mean, certainly understand the need to do that, um, but do your best. Um, we have a question from Enka. Enka, what's your question for Jane Brody. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your uh, columns. Uh, firstly, they're, they're such great reading. So please do continue to send us information. My question is about the masks. Um, I hear the N95 masks are better because they seal better around the cheek area. Uh, we, we are able to just get uh, two of them, my husband and I. And so my question is, how often can we reuse it? I realize that they're very precious, so we didn't take more than two. Um, is it wise to use like a Lysol wipe on the front of it um, after using it? We only use it when we go out to the grocery store for about a half yeah. an hour. And otherwise, we're not with people. We're just walking by ourselves in, in a... I think, I think what you're doing is a very, very good idea because you do not want to throw that mask away. They are hard to come by and they're really needed by our essential workers and especially the medical people. Um, the, I have one of those. I found it in my house. I don't know how long it's been sitting here, but it, it had expired and therefore I couldn't donate it. Um, in the beginning, they only wanted ones that hadn't expired. But yes, wipe it down. No, 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 no. Don't wipe it down. <laughs> Don't wipe it down. What, what hey, I've, I've actually talked to a lot of mask experts about this. The best what? thing you can do for your N95, if you wipe it down, you're going to degrade the filtration on it. So you don't want to wipe it. You want to let it air out. Um, oh. Most people let it air out over 24 hours, but you really should not use Lysol on it. Don't use a wipe. Don't use soap and water. Um, they've done tests and every time you clean it, you're going to degrade the filtration by about 2%. So over time, but you can, if you're very careful with your mask, if you don't touch it, if you don't handle it, and if you just let it air out in a safe place, a lot of what the doctors do is they put it in a, a brown, like a paper bag. Don't put it in plastic because that's too much moisture. Put it in a paper bag and mark it if you want to keep it, you know, separate from your, your partner, or just let it hang on a hook um, and let the air, air is a great sanitizer with this virus. So if you probably don't have virus on the mask, but if you did and you just let it sit for, you know, 24 hours, you're, you're probably going to be okay. But there really isn't a good way for us to sanitize masks at home the way they, the medical workers do. They have these tents with hydrogen peroxide spray, and we don't want to do that because we will, if we do it our way, we'll degrade the mask. So I would say, uh, you know, I like that you just have one. Um, use it when you need to use it, but I would not, you don't want to mess with it too much because you want it to keep its filtration. So Thank sorry, you, Sarah, interrupt. because I'm <laughs> glad to know because I, I have never cleaned my mask. I just yeah. simply use it and I hang it up. I dispense the night off my face. That is the right thing to do. So yeah, so a lot of people think it's better to clean the mask. It is better to not clean the mask. Um, Lisa, we'd love to hear from you. What's your question? Hi, Lisa. Lisa, are you with us? If not, we're probably gonna go to Bet. Bet, what's your question? Okay, hi. hi. I live alone. I'm doing pretty well at feeding myself. Occasionally, I get an urge for something. And I went out for, if you know what a Michigan is, uh, <laughs> it was curbside, it was delivered to me. How do I know that it's been prepared safely? And is it okay to do this? What is a Michigan? Oh. <laughs> I live in Plattsburgh, New York, which is right near Canada. It is a hot dog with a special kind of um, sauce on it that is ground meat and some kind of tomato. I would not worry about eating cooked food. I would okay. really not worry about eating cooked food. If you're going to get any sort of source of contamination, it's in the wrapper that they put around it when they give it to you. Um, and and you know, you're going to eat the damn thing. It's, it'll be fine. And then you wash your hands as soon as you're finished. Yeah. And what I'm going to agree. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jane. 
No, that's all. I was ask you what you think, Tara. Yeah, I was going to agree with you because this is not a foodborne illness. And it's a little confusing because if your hands have come into contact with a virus, we don't want you touching your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. But what happens if you, in that situation, the virus gets a chance to kind of settle in and to replicate in your body. Um, so that's why we worry about more the wrapper and you um, having, you know, contacting some contamination on the wrapper. When you actually eat the food and your digestive juices kick in, um, I've actually asked this very question because it's a little it's a little confusing because we don't really want to touch our mouths with dirty hands, but we're eating food and why is that safe? <laughs> and and it just it's, it's how the virus acts in the body. That on cooked food you're safe. Uh, if you're you know you're chewing and you're eating and you're swallowing and going to your digestive system, this is not a foodborne virus. So enjoy um, that delicacy. Thank you for sharing it with us. And we'd love now to hear from Cheryl. Cheryl, what's your question? Yes, I have a question about if and when the gyms finally reopen. And um, I worked out with weight. Uh, what's the best way to avoid any virus? All right, Jane, what do you think about going back well, to the gym? If, if if you if the gym reopens, if they're not if they don't have people on site who clean the equipment all the time after everybody uses it, then I, I would not be comfortable using it myself while this virus is circulating in our society, which it's going to be for quite some time to come. Now you can bring your own wipes and wipe down everything. I mean we used to wipe the machines before we got on them, uh it, at the gym that I use at a Y. Uh, so why not do it yourself? Yeah, I think I would use wipes too. I, I probably wouldn't go back to the gym for a while, but I know some people are going to be making that choice and hopefully the gyms are going to be cleaning and social distancing. I would probably wear a mask. Um, so we have five questions in five minutes. Can we do it, Jane? Let's try. try Wendy, it. Wendy, ask your question. We'd love to hear from you. Wendy. <laughs> Is Wendy gone? We could try the next caller. Oh, hold on. I me now. I, I'm here. Wendy, great. Oh, okay. I didn't realize I had to unmute myself. That's okay. What's your question? <laughs> okay. I've got a question about um, acupuncture and chiropractic. I have not, uh, I, I find that, that using acupuncture and chiropractic um, is helpful to me, but I haven't gone since, um, you know, early March and I'm just wondering your opinion. Jane, you have some thoughts? I, you know, this is hands-on stuff, and I, I honestly, I have not seen a single therapist who has to touch my body or come that close to me. I mean, why, why are you not getting your hair cut? You're not getting your hair cut because the person who cuts your hair has to stand right over you, and this, this is not a good plan at this point. I think I, I agree. I would just, if you really do want to go back or you need to go back, I think I would just ask the practitioner what precautions they're taking. Um, you know, it's going to be a personal decision. It's one I would not make, but I understand why people might want to do that. Sally, we would love to hear from you. What's your question? Yes, um, I've enjoyed the uh, six minute uh, exercise videos. Great. Um, but uh, the link doesn't work anymore. What do I need to do to be able to access those? Sally, send me an email at tpp at nytimes.com. We have, I believe we've fixed that, but if you're having a problem, I'd love to hear more from you, and I'd love to get that fixed for you and any other uh, reader that's having a problem. So if anybody has a question, you can just email me at tpp at nytimes.com, and I will sort it out for you. Tom, what is your question? Hi, Tara and Jane. My question is, my wife and I are living in Southern California this semester. I had surgery in late January. My question is, when do you think it's safe to come back to New York? Or do you think we should just stay out here in Southern California until further notice? My doctor said to come back again in mid to late June. And we've extended here until June 23rd. What do you think? When do you think it'll be okay to come back to see doctors in New York? Or I, we I, wish I, I wish I had a crystal ball about this. We don't have a crystal ball. I, I listened to the governor. I listen to the instructions that he's given and, and, you know, we have to be extremely careful as the society reopens gradually, things are going to pop and they already are popping in some of the places that have loosened up their social uh, restrictions. So uh, if, I, if, if you're comfortable staying in Southern California, by all means, I think you should. 
Yeah, Southern um, California sounds lovely, doesn't it? I think you also yeah. need to check with your doctor because um, a lot of hospitals here are not, he, your doctor may not even be available for the checkup by June. They might push it out. So I would email um, your doctor, have a conversation about what makes sense. Maybe it makes sense for you to see a doctor in California or they might, he might, or she might say, you know, if you, if you see me in August, we'll be okay too. So I would just have, to, you need to have that conversation with your doctor. Um, I agree. It's not really time to start moving around too much. Um, Elizabeth, we'd love to hear your question. Elizabeth. She'll be here. I'm sure of it. Elizabeth, you're on mute. We want to hear from you. Yep. Okay, I think we might go to Claudia. Or Cla is it Claudia? Are you on the line? Hi, um, I'm living in Newport, California. Um, I live in this apartment, beautiful apartment complex. And yesterday was very disturbing to see people all over on the lawn in our outside apartment and they party around. And today I hear in my my level, my floor, have somebody cough really, really hard. So my question is, in this kind of situation, because I have a child, he has a respiratory issue. So we we think maybe we should move, move to somewhere just a little less density or live in the friend's house, which is empty, to avoid this kind of situation. Well, well if you have a place to move to, and you're comfortable doing it, that sounds like a possible solution. But what are the social, what are the rules of, of your, where you're living? I mean, are they allowing this? If they're not allowing it, you have a right to call authorities and say that they're violating the, the rules. Yeah, I agree. I think you should probably talk to your apartment management company and find out what they're doing to enforce things. It's great that you have these other options and you, I think you should probably weigh all the pros and cons of those options. Um, I think that if you are keeping your distance um, and, you know, taking precautions yourself, you're, you know, you're going to be avo avoiding those crowds. And if, if, if moving is too disruptive, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, people are going to be sick around us and we have to just, uh, you know, make make the best of the situation, wear a mask, wash our hands, take all the precautions and do our best to avoid it. So hopefully you can talk to your, your apartment management company um, and decide with your family what the best option is for you in terms of your living situation. But it is frustrating when other people um, aren't following the rules. So Jane, um, let's, um, let's end on a, a positive note. Give us something happy to think about. You mentioned that you really enjoyed this one bright thing uh, topic that you had read in the Times. Yes, that's an absolutely wonderful thing. Each day, each day, before, especially before you go to bed, think about one lovely thing that happened that day that makes you feel good or one person who makes you feel good. Or if you can't do that, call that one person who makes you feel good. I have a 92-year-old friend. Actually, she's soon going to be 93. And she lives in Minnesota. And whenever I need to be cheered up, by, for any reason whatsoever, I call her. I mean, she is the most incredible human being. She's absolutely sharp as a tack, and she always has something good to say. She's very realistic. She lives in an assisted living place where she can't go anywhere, and yet she is managing to keep her spirits up, and she manages to keep my spirits up, too, when I need to. Thank you, Jane. And you keep all of our spirits up. So thank you for all the work that you do um, and for your column all these years. Um, we just always love hearing from you. And thank you, Tara, because you do great work too. <laughs> well, you were my inspiration. You were the trailblazer. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Our thanks especially to Jane for answering your questions. This event is a weekly series. It's gonna start taking place Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern. So I hope you'll join us right back here next week. We'll have more special guests and we'll talk about, um, take your questions and talk about whatever's on your mind. To find out more about our full slate of digital events, please visit Times Events dot nytimes.com and finally we want to give a special thank you to all of our subscribers you make our work possible we look forward to speaking with all of you again goodbye <laughs>